Hello. For those of you that um, I didn't get to meet this morning, I'm Anna. And I'm so honored to be here today with all of you to celebrate education and fashion. And it's a great, great privilege to be able to say a few words to introduce the First Lady, whose vision and leadership have brought us all together. The word that comes to mind when I think of the First Lady is nurture. And not only because she is such an engaged and loving mother. Through such exceptional programs as Let's Move, Joining Forces, and Reach Higher, she is constantly thinking about how best to provide all of us with the right ingredients for a full life, especially our young people. And education, in her view, is the key to the whole thing. We have to nurture our minds and the minds of the next generation. And that's why we are here today, as she has once again turned the White House into a center of creativity and collaboration for students from across the country. Now, nurturing and fashion are not words you might expect to hear spoken of together. Fashion is often dismissed as anything but. I beg to differ. Fashion provides employment and opportunity for people around the world. Some of you students learned today about the nuts and bolts of the business, which is just invaluable. After all, as anyone at the top of their field will tell you, it's almost impossible to soar without first knowing every inch of the terrain before you. One of my first jobs in the States was at New York Magazine. And one of the very first designers who came to see me there traveled by subway, carrying a small bag of sample designs. He was the CEO of his own company, the PR, the one that answered the phone. He was a one-man show. That young man's name was Michael Kors. But fashion nurtures our culture in other ways as well. As I've seen time and time again, it can be a powerful instrument for social change, raising awareness of causes from AIDS to breast cancer to hunger. Fashion also allows us to think about who we are as individually and as a society, and to be creative and bold every single day. In the end, it really doesn't matter if you follow the latest trends. What matters is that you feel your best, ready to tackle anything. I think the First Lady is the perfect embodiment of this basic truth, and as such, she has certainly been a great, great source of inspiration to me, and I'm sure to all of you. It used to be that I would come down here to DC I felt I represented an industry that was decidedly unserious. I was the woman from New York in the funny clothes uh, who kept insisting that fashion mattered. The First Lady, with her confidence and elegance, has shown us all that you can engage with the vital issues of our time, and you can do it with a style and authenticity that can make a difference for families all across the country. But she can probably explain it the best. And so, ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome the First Lady of the United States, Michelle Obama. gonna break this up one moment and just say is, is is this not cool I mean come on you're in the White House there are some of the most impressive people in fashion here to teach you all and to reach out and to mentor you and there's food <laughs> what more could you ask for well welcome to the White House and let me start by thanking Anna uh, for that very kind introduction and for her tremendous passion and leadership in making this day a reality. Uh, we started cooking this up a little while ago uh, and it's just been a thrill to be able to bring this vision to reality. So Anna, thank you so much. Uh, I also want to thank everyone from the Parsons, uh, the New School for Design uh, for helping us today, the Fashion Institute of Technology, uh, the Pratt Institute of Technology, along with all of the incredible designers and entrepreneurs, the fashion journalists 
who have taken time out of their very busy days uh, to be here with all of you. Let's give them all a round of applause. And uh, there are two groups that I want to give special recognition to. First, all of the students and faculty from Parsons who created the incredible decor that you see here on the tables in the East Room. Well done. Thank you guys, thank you so much. And second, I want to recognize the two winners of our design competition uh, for uh, this, this event. Um, the dress that I am wearing today and the dress that you see here uh, were designed by two students who are with us today. Um, Chelsea Chen, Chelsea, stand up please. Chelsea designed this dress. Great job. <laughs> and Natalia Koval, please stand up. Natalia designed this dress. Well done. Oh, did it switch around? Natalia designed this dress. Chelsea designed that dress. Well done. <laughs> Good job. They're both students at FIT. And Natalia and Chelsea, thank you. Thank you for your creativity. Thank you for your passion. We're very proud of you. I, I hope you had fun doing this. Uh, and I want to thank the, the designer mentors who helped them uh, bring their ideas to life. Philip Lim and Leela Rose. Philip and, and Leela, thank you both for working with Natalia and Chelsea today. In these dresses that you see and in this room, we see the incredible promise that lies within our next generation. And that's really what today is all about. It's about all of you young people who are here in this room with us and uh, all the young people who couldn't be in this room and, and your dreams. Uh, we really do focus on how you're going to get where you're going to go. Uh, and that's what this is all about. I know that many of you are hoping to one day pursue a career in fashion, and that's why we invited you here today, because we want you to really understand what it's going to take to be successful. And we want you to see firsthand that a solid education and the willingness to work hard is really at the core of what it's going to take to achieve your goals. Education and hard work, it's that simple. Uh, today's workshop is one in a series of events that we have done over the past six years for young people across the country. Uh, we have been doing this since the day we entered the White House um, for young people. We want them to be in this house and experience the things that they're passionate about. And this workshop is one of many, whether it's music or dance or poetry, our mission is always the same, to inspire you guys to dream bigger, to reach higher, and then most importantly, to pull somebody else up with you along the way. Because you're sitting in these seats makes you really special, but it doesn't make you unique. Because you know for every kid uh, that is sitting in this chair, you know probably 10 others who could be sitting in this chair. Uh, so that's where the give back comes in. Because you've got to be thinking, I was lucky and blessed to be here, so what am I going to do? to share these gifts with somebody else. Now, when it comes to the fashion industry, uh, so often people think it's all about catwalks and red carpets and who wore it best. And whether some famous person wore the right belt with the right shoes, like I'd know what that's like. <laughs> um, but the truth is that the clothes you see and the magazine covers are really just the finished product in what is a very long, very complicated, and a very difficult process, as I've come to learn working with many designers. Uh, what most people don't realize is that there are so many different aspects to this industry, whether it's business marketing or technology and manufacturing, uh, even agriculture that produces the wool and the cotton that ultimately becomes our clothes. Uh, it's a big, complicated industry. Uh, the industry is also a huge contributor to this economy. 
Uh, last year alone, Americans spent more than $350 billion on clothing and footwear. And about 1.4 million American workers are employed annually by retailers and others in the fashion industry. Uh, so a lot of jobs, a lot of uh, income uh, that is generated by many of the people who are sitting in this room. But for so many of you, whether you're already in the industry or aspiring to be there someday, I know that in the end, fashion is really about passion and creativity. Uh, just like music or dance or poetry, it's what drives you. Uh, it's, it's what gets you out of bed each morning. It's what you write about in essays in school and what you read about in the news. It occupies every ounce of your daily lives. I know this because with creative people, that's what their passion does. It makes everything else worthwhile. Fashion is about so much more than just a pretty pair of pumps or the perfect hemline. For so many people across the country, it is a calling, it is a career, and it's a way they feed their families. So that's why we thought it was important to bring the industry to the White House and to share it with all of you who are coming up in the next generation. Today in your breakout sessions, you all have had a chance to see all the different aspects of the industry, and there are many, many more aspects. We just didn't have the time. Um, but you, you, you learn the business sense that you need to strike out on your own. So there's a very entrepreneurial aspect to this industry. You learn the writing and verbal skills that you need to communicate your inspiration with others because the bottom line is that if you can't share your thoughts and ideas, no one will hear them. There's no mind reading in fashion de design. You have to be able to articulate what you want, so you have to be a reader, a writer, a thinker, a communicator. Uh, you learn the highly specialized construction skills that you all can only learn through hours and years of education and practice and technical training. You know, this doesn't just come out of just talent, sheer creativity. You have to practice it. You have to learn it. You have to study it. And those are the kind of concrete skills that you all will need to succeed. And it's important to you know, for you all to know that there's concreteness to this work. And it's easy to lose sight of that um, because it's easy for us to look at the accomplished people in this room and think, well, it, it must have been easy being Jason Wu, right? Jason's like, not so much. <laughs> that the style and the creativity have just flowed from these people since the day they were born. Uh, it's easy to think that it's easy. But these folks will tell you that that's never really been the case. What they have learned over the course of their illustrious careers is that the path to success is rarely ever easy or obvious. Instead, they know that in order to exceed, they know that you have to be prepared, that you've got to hone your skills in ed ed college or at design school. You've got to be willing to take some risk. And you also have to be prepared to fail a lot. Uh, all these things are essential for the journey. And that's true for fashion, but it's true for everything else. Risks, failure is a part of being great. Uh, so embrace that. Don't fear it. And the most important thing you've got to do is work and work and work and work and work. That's, that's it. It's hard work. Sorry. <laughs> Years and even decades before you can achieve your goals. Just take Sarah Blakely, for example. After she graduated uh, from college, Sarah worked at Disney World, buckling in people into their seats for the rides. Dag, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah did that for a while. And then she went on to sell fax machines for an office supply company. And then she got this idea. Uh, and she took a risk. She devoted her entire savings, $5,000, uh, to start her own company. She spent two years planning and researching her new business ideas in the nights while she was still selling fax machines. Uh, she pitched her idea to factories and mills, asking them to help her make the product a reality. And of course, she was turned down again and again and again. But finally, a manager at a factory liked her idea 
And today, 14 years later, Sarah's idea, Spanx, is a multi-billion dollar company with products selling in more than 50 countries. So, and we all wear them <laughs> with pride. And then there's my friend Mar Maria Cornejo, who grew up in Chile, knitting and sewing clothes for her dolls. Uh, when she was 11, her family fled to England as political refugees. Uh, and Maria didn't speak a word of English, and she says she always felt like an outsider. Uh, but then she realized that she could make a career out of fashion. So she went to design school, and she studied fashion and textiles, and she started her own business. And today, Maria's got a company based in New York. She won a National Design Award for fashion. She is one of my favorite designers. She's earned fans all around the world. And she is probably one of the sweetest, most gracious people that I've met uh, over the course of these years. Uh, so to all of you guys in this room, I, I want those stories, the stories of Sarah and Maria, and I'm sure there are many, many others as you talk to people at your tables. I want those stories to show you that there's no magic to being successful in fashion or in anything else. What is required is a willingness to work long nights, to suffer through rejection and failure, uh, to rise above all of that, all the doubts and the fears and the anxieties, whether you come from you know, the city, the suburbs, no matter who you are, where you come from, all those feelings are natural. It's a natural part of life. Maybe you do feel like an outsider. Uh, maybe you, you've been told that your ideas aren't any good. Uh, or maybe your family doesn't have much money. Uh, maybe you're the first one in your family to go to college and you're wondering whether you're even going to make it. Uh, whoever you are, wherever you come from, I want you to again know that those worries and doubts are natural. It's okay, every single person in this room, including me, everyone who has been successful at anything has doubted themselves and has uh, had someone else doubt them. But what successful people don't do is let their doubts and fears shut them down. That's what you cannot do. They brush off the doubters, they brush off the haters, they reach out for help, which is key. Uh, they use those emotions to inspire them to work even harder to create their own futures. So today I want all of you to know that you belong here. You belong right here in the White House. Yeah, yeah. So look, you belong right here next to Jason Wu and Anna Wintour and Narciso and I could go on. You belong here. This is your home. So own it, okay? Because if you can sit at these tables and spend this day here and meet with all these great people, then you can do anything. But you have to know that. And you have to tell yourselves that every single day. Remember this moment and remember that the First Lady of the United States told you that you can do anything you want to. And we're counting on you. We are proud of you. Your president is proud of you. He knows this is going on. He's just a little busy. <laughs> So I want you to take advantage of this day. I want you to network with each other. Uh, I want you to continue working hard, you know, and, and, and know that failure is a part of the growth that you will need to be great. Uh, so we are so pleased to have you here. And if you, if you feel like this day was special, it's because we think you all are special and you all are worthy of the efforts that we put in to making this day special for you. So thank you guys. Thank you so much. So now I'm going to make sure you guys eat the, the plates. Are, oh, yes, yeah, some people have eaten. That's good. That's good. Make sure you continue to eat. And I'm going to pass the uh, stage on to Liliana Vasquez, who is going to introduce our panel. Uh, and I know you guys are still fired up, ready to go ask questions, all that good stuff. So uh, Liliana, please come up and join me and you can introduce the panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you. So 
I really am so excited to be here in front of you, and the panel that I have the honor of moderating today is an incredible group of people. So they're all scattered amongst you. Probably you step up here and join us. Uh -huh. um, Jason, there's Jason right there. <laughs> um, Diane, who's at table nine. It's a fabulous table. <laughs> Um, Tracy, I'm not, Tracy Reese. Um, and then Edward, where are you? I've been hanging with you all day. This is, this is, isn't this a great panel? I know. And then Jenna Lyons. Jenna, Jenna. <laughs> She's right in the front. And then did you Hello. Hello. Yeah. Okay, so really quickly, I want you guys just in one quick sentence. Hello. 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 You want me to use the wireless? Hello. Hello. I think Diane's is actually not working as well. Hello. Mine isn't no. Neither uh, is Oh, no, it is. It okay, is. there we go. Now we have audio. So really quickly, nope, still one more. Yeah, neither is Edwards. I'm going to raise your mic if it's not <coughs> working. Hello. Hello. Okay. Good. Hello? Hello? Jenna, you good? I'm good. Jason, good? Yes. All right. So really quickly, if you guys could just introduce who you are and what you do. Um, probably we'll start with you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Prabal Gurung, and I'm a fashion designer in New York. I'm Edward Wilkerson. I'm the creative director of Lafayette 148. I'm Diane von Furstenberg, and... I'm an old-fashioned designer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Tracy Reese. I'm also a fashion designer. I'm um, Jason Wu, and I'm a fashion designer. I'm Jenna Lyons. I'm a designer and creative director at J. Crew. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Well, I'd have to say that it's really difficult to have a dialogue about fashion today without mentioning just one of our panelists. I think we can all agree. They are easily some of the most respected and recognize names in this business. And I could probably spend just the next hour listing the accolades of just one of them. But I only have 45 minutes. Um, now, their companies represent more than a few billion dollars in sales. Uh, they have a combined experience of over 125 years in the industry. Now, that does not make them old by any means at all. That makes them experienced vets that are here to inspire you and show you the ropes. And of course, their companies employ thousands, tens of thousands jobs across the US and abroad. But enough talking about who they are. I really want to focus this panel on talking about who they were. Who were they as students? Um, who were they as young people, just like you when they were in high school? And of course, who were they as young designers when they were really just starting to make a name for themselves in this business? And what I really hope to accomplish is to demonstrate that as diverse as they all are and as different as their paths and their backgrounds may be, education is the one common thread that really unites all of their success stories. So you guys have had very storied careers, and I know there's been a lot of special moments, but going back to what Mrs. Obama said, what has been the coolest moment that just made you stop dead in your tracks and say, wow, I cannot believe this is happening to me. Could have been when you were younger, now. What's that one kind of moment where you thought, okay, I got this. I'm gonna start with you. Me, wow. Yes. I think today is pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> I echo that sentiment. <laughs> yeah, I think we all feel that way. And um, uh, I think being here in the path to getting here, um, has been amazing. It's been tough. It hasn't always been fun. Don't get into fashion if you want glamour. That's really not. It's a side. It's a side note. It's not <laughs> the uh, the main event. Um, 
But yeah, this is, this is wonderful. We, we have wonderful careers. And I think, I'm looking at Zach and you know, he's smiling because we all know we do what we love. And I think that's the most important thing you can take away. Do what you love and put your love into it. Absolutely. Diane? <clears throat> yeah. Well, I think the most important thing to know is that whatever you do at the base, you have to be serious. And if you are serious first, then you can have fun at the top. Then you can be frivolous, mischievous, crazy. But what is important is that the foundation is serious. That's the most important thing. Um, we all, you know, when we start and we are young, <clears throat> unless you know from the very beginning that you're going to be a pianist or a doctor. Most of us, I mean, a lot of us don't know where we are going to go and don't know what we are going to do. And when you are young, it is most important that first you study because that first moment of studying, that, that is what will stay with you forever. And then you kind of have to, I mean, you know, life is full of possibilities, and there are doors there. And, and, and sometimes there's a door that you don't think is a good door for you at all. And you push your door, and, 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 and your life changes. So my advice to anyone is just keep your eyes open and be open. Be open to everything. Just be curious. And, you know, when I, when, uh, um, um, I met a, a man who had a factory, had a printing factory, and and he, where he also made the jersey. When he came and invited me to be an intern and to look at what he did, I had no idea that this man was going to be the most important person, almost the most important person <laughs> in my life. And, um, and then I came to America and uh, whatever, and then I made a few little dresses in his factory. Or just the iconic wrap dress that right. everybody has at least 10 of, yes. But, <laughs> but no, but at first it was just, you know, I was very shy about it and I was just, and then I walked into Vogue and there was Mrs. Vreeland, you know, the, the Anna Winter of my time. And, and, uh, and she, nobody understood those stupid little dresses that didn't look like anything. She said, this is, Great. So that. she encouraged me. And then I, I followed the encouragement and I listened to her assistant who said, do this and do that. And I did this and I did that. That was 72. In 1976, I was in this room having dinner. I was next to President Ford at the time. And I had beat, and I was also on the cover of Newsweek at 28. So that was your that moment. Was the moment. That was her moment. What an amazing moment. And <laughs> it was just a few years. Doesn't mean that after that it was all heaven and roses and this, because it isn't. It is never roses and there's always difficulties and the challenges change and everything. But the most important thing is to be serious and to be true to yourself. Because yeah. truth will never fail. Thank you, Diane, that was un unbelievable. Now, let's rewind for some of you, go back in time here. Um, I wanna know, probably what piqued your interest in clothes first? Um, just so f whoever doesn't know, I'm from Nepal. It's a really tiny little country between India and China. And um, um, so when I, I went to an all boys British Catholic school and um, I was very different from the rest of the boys there and all I wanted to do was you know, sketch and just be, I was pretty much lost in my own world and I was told early on I was very different in a good way, in a bad way, bad, good way for my family, I mean, in a not so great way for my peers and so that's what I you know, kind of um, understood um, that the thing that I had was I was different. I was constantly told I was different. And that led me to discover different things. That led me to discover, led, pushed me instead of to the, let's say, the sports field, you know, I went to the library and I started exploring more. And my first, um, even in Nepal, was a Vogue magazine, you know, and uh, it was there that I think, you know, I just understood or kind of like, you know, was excited about it. So this was way back um, in the 90s, and then when, so I, I was always kind of, you know, I, I think the f 
the thing about fashion, at, at that time, I didn't know what I, whether it was going to be my career because everyone back home in Nepal, I'm, I'm probably the first fashion designer from Nepal. And then, you know, like at the time when I wanted to, when I told everyone, besides my family, my family was very supportive, but when I told everyone that I wanted to come to America, I'd never been to America, I'd nev and I traveled everywhere else, I'd never been to America, and I applied to Parsons School, and I told everyone, you know, I want to study fashion, and everyone was like, well, that's a good hobby, but what do you really want to do? You know, so that was the thing, that's how it started for me, so. And I'm sure others here have heard that same expression, where, oh, that's a great hobby to have, but how do you really, you know, start to turn that more into a career now. Jason, I know you started designing doll clothes. Is that correct? <laughs> well, so you had tiny, itty bitty designs. Well, I mean, it can relate a lot to Pablo's story because yeah. I, I definitely grew up different. And, uh, you know, my brother was very athletic and I was very not. I'm still not. <laughs> 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 so, um, no, I mean, I, I, I just, you know, I wanted to have dolls, like, during my birthday, and I wanted pretty things, and it wasn't really so cool in Taiwan, you know, people were like, oh, that's weird, <laughs> and, uh, and it was weird, but I learned to accept that over the years, that being weird is fine, and being weird is good, yeah. and being weird makes you, you. Makes you unique. And uh, it took me a very, I mean, it's easier said than done, it took me many, many years to realize that. Um, I, I don't even think I realized that until I was in my 20s. I just felt like, well, I, I guess I'm stuck with me, so I, I'm going to be, the best, I'm gonna be, be. <laughs> the best me I can be. But, um, you know, definitely it was really, you know, coming to America that I realized that there were so many opportunities that you could do and be whoever you want to be. And, uh, and, and, and for me to be sitting here in the White House in, in, in front of Mrs. O and... Uh, <laughs> And uh, and all of you is really, it's a life changing experience. I think it is. Now, Jenna, you have incredible style. Now, in high school, I definitely made a lot of fashion mistakes. What would you say was the best and worst trend when you were in high school? Oh God, <laughs> hard. Um, I had asymmetrical hair. It was <laughs> not a good look. <laughs> um, that was probably the worst one. I feel like I didn't get a good question. Can oh, I answer their question? Oh, you have lots coming. You want to answer? You wanna I want to answer their, because I think it's amazing. You have an incredible story. Well, Why having, don't you listening, listening to their stories, what is amazing to me is I had no idea. Um, I'd actually not heard your story. And, but listening to feeling different, I think, I don't know um, if any of you have ever felt a little bit outcast. I know that I did. I grew up with a genetic disorder, which was awesome. Um, I had conicular teeth, which if you don't know what that means, my teeth looked like little posts, little round, yeah, that was not so fun. And I had huge bald spots in the back of my head, which I did not even know I had until I heard the girls whispering behind me saying, oh my God, look at her head. <laughs> and so I was pretty much teased pretty mercilessly for most of my young age. And I thought that I was also super skinny and really tall. And so I thought that I didn't have any sense of who I was or what I looked like or my size. And so I was shopping the big and tall section, which there was no, you know, J brand jeans and tall skinny, like that did not exist. So I looked a little strange at school. I was dressed in gigantic clothes and it was strange. Anyway, I took a home ec class, which I don't know if you guys know what that is. It's home economics where you learn how to balance a checkbook. I failed that part. Do you guys know what home ec is? It's home ec, yes. yeah. Okay, well the older people in the room definitely do. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and one of the things we had to, we had to learn how to sew, um, the cooking part and the balancing checkbook part I never went back to. The sewing part rocked, I was really into that. Um, but what was in, what incredible was that we actually had to make something for ourselves and so I had to measure my own body and actually pick a pattern and when I did that, I made this watermelon skirt which I really remember distinctly and um, I went to school the next day and like the most popular girl in school, Darlene Patterson, asked me, <laughs> I remember, where I got my skirt and it was the first time anyone had ever given me a compliment about something that I had not only done, but how I looked. And I realized that not only did it was it fun for me to actually make it, but I realized how transformative the experience was and how feeling good about myself was really made me feel better just overall. And so it made me want to be able to do that for my life because it was actually something that not only did it make me feel good, but I realized it was a way I could make other people feel good. That. And I think everybody finds their way to fashion in such different ways, but there's also, you know, an emotional connection to it. For you, it was very emotional. But let's go back to talking about how you transitioned from being passionate about fashion or design or clothes. And can how I, can I just say something yes, of before? Course. Because I think it's important for everybody to know uh, from the story of Jenna is that what I think is also important is that you have to realize that your vulnerabilities are as valuable as your strength. 
and you have to put your vulnerabilities and your weaknesses and your sense of differences in, <clears throat> in the category of assets. Absolutely. And that's another good trick. Incredible advice. So let's talk about someone, you know, your educational path to fashion. So Tracy, talk to me a little bit about this because you attended um, public school in Detroit, correct? Um, I'm from Detroit. I'm a proud Detroiter, and I went to public school, you know, from elementary through high school. And you know, I was super fortunate that my mom was so involved um, in our lives and in our education. Um, and it was important to her that we stay in public schools. And uh, she was always at school, and she was always threatening to be at school um, to make sure I was eating lunch instead of chocolate milk and ice cream sandwiches. And you know, one time I was doing that, and she was like standing outside the door, and I was like, <laughs> she's really here. But um, it was important to her, and she, she shopped around, and she changed regions for us, and did all kinds of stuff. But it's interesting, because out of three girls, I was in the middle, and I was always shy. I didn't speak. I didn't talk. I let my sisters talk. They were both really popular. And um, that was fine with me. I admired them. I loved that about them. And I was fine to just sort of step back. And fashion really brought me out. Um, and it gave me a voice. But uh, going to public school, I think you have to make opportunities for yourself. And I think it's important to be involved in your school environment as much as possible. I had clubs every morning. I was at school at 715, French Club, Honor Society, um, American Youth Hostels. Don't ask. <laughs> we, we would go cross country skiing. But um, I wanted to be involved. And I had a high school, luckily, that promoted that kind of involvement, and it was exciting. But I got to meet people from other curriculums and you know other neighborhoods and developed a community of friends. Um, and everybody was doing stuff, and we were able to support each other. Um, and luckily, we had fantastic teachers who enlightened me about Parsons. And um, I didn't think I would be a designer, because same thing, it's a nice hobby, is what you, you know, kind of felt or were led to believe. And my mom and I sewed together all the time. We made outfits and we had races. And you know, if you finished your outfit first, you had to buy the other one a metallic belt, a metallic <laughs> cummerbund belt, because that was the trend. But um, I always thought it was a hobby. I didn't think it was a serious profession. Until I came to Parsons, and I, I won a scholarship to Parsons uh, for a summer program for high school students. And I was always um, very focused in school and very competitive, mostly in a good way. Um, and it was important for me to achieve and get good grades. And um, that allowed me to get scholarships to, to school. So the summer program for students was, for high school students was amazing. And I, I encourage you all to, to look for these opportunities. They're not going to present themselves to you necessarily, but if there's something that you're interested in, do the research and find out what opportunities are available to you. What can you, yeah. you know, how can you access your dream? Absolutely. Now, Edward, I want to talk to you a little bit about going back to your high school days. You were also very creative from the start. You're an incredible artist. You're an incredible designer. What are some creative and easy ways that these students and underclassmen in college can expose themselves to creative environments or skills if maybe they're not offered in their high school? Well, you can go to a museum to start. Mm -hmm. You know, I was constantly in museums, um, but I wanted to be an architect first, so design really came second. Um, I basically, the teacher said, we don't think this is for you. Really? Yeah. So they discouraged you? It discouraged me, kicked me out of class. <laughs> <laughs> he sent me to the principal's office and he said, well, what else would you like to do? I said, I'm interested in clothes. He said, well, why didn't you go to art and design? And I said, well, they didn't accept me. He said, I know the principal, show up tomorrow. That's how it happened. And um, then I wanted to go to um, FIT. I took the test twice. No, I got into Parsons with a scholarship. Did you hear that? He just said he took the test twice. And that, it, that you go for an interview. Yeah, and then he got, then he got yeah. Right, and then <laughs> exactly. I got a scholarship to go to Parsons. Um, but you know, just going through that, that kind of exposure 
um, my wanting to expose myself to different buildings. It was just natural, it was innate. I didn't study architecture. I, I did for one semester, but um, it was just something I had inside me, like design. Um, and then into Parsons, my junior year, they said, we don't think you have what it takes. I heard that one more time. Um, and I was already working. I got my first summer job at Ann Klein in my junior year in high school. And I worked for Donna Karen for 15 years. And then I went on to Calvin Klein. Um, and it was a great experience because I exposed myself to these people. I actually got my job in my junior year by walking to up and down 7th Avenue, riding in the elevators to see who could see my portfolio. Okay, and it, it's amazing that I didn't get any response from the smaller houses. When I went to Calvin Klein, they said, come back in an hour. I went down to Ann Klein, I was hired. Um, right on the spot. Yeah. That's great. Now, if you guys can all think back to when you were applying to college, for all of these students, it's a really stressful time in life. You know, you're stressed about what school you're going to choose, what program you're going to be a part of, how you're going to pay for college. There's so many things that are contributing to being stressed about it. So as these young people near graduation, what do you think they should be looking for specifically in a program? What, what did you look for in a program? Jenna, what did you look for in a program when you were... Starting. Uh, I mean, I think I think what's happened. Where when I was l looking, it was so different than what it's like for you guys now. I mean, when I was looking for a program, there were no choices. There was no. You couldn't be a merchandiser. You couldn't be a stylist. You couldn't be a hair and makeup person. None of those jobs. I didn't even know they existed. So, I think what I was looking for maybe isn't necessarily as relative to what you guys are faced with now. I think there are so many more choices. There was no internet when I was looking for colleges, so I couldn't Google fashion or Google beauty or any of those things or magazines. I didn't know that you could be editor to magazine. I just didn't know. And so I think all I would say is research is probably the best thing. And good news is there's Google. <laughs> Use it healthily, wide, widely, and, and see what is exciting to you. You know, you may not want to be a designer. You may not feel as comfortable sketching, but you may love clothes, and maybe you'd be a great stylist. Or maybe you could actually be an amazing tech designer, and you want to actually do more about what hap how the clothes are made. Or maybe you want to you know, do something where you're actually working on fabric, and maybe textiles get you excited, and you want to do fabric research. There's all kinds of jobs. A ton of opportunities. The other thing I think is so incredibly helpful, and if you can, before you are looking for college, if you can, during high school years, try and get an internship. Right. It doesn't matter what level or kind of company, anyone who makes clothes, to see kind of what goes on. And I was actually Edward's intern. Yes. <laughs> was she a good intern? 24 years ago. <laughs> and actually, when you are an intern, remember one thing. Come, be the first to arrive and the last to leave, and they'll notice you. <laughs> and I think yes. that, you know, Mrs. Obama talked about working hard. I think we all have to be prepared to work hard. I still work hard. I've been in this industry for 30 years, and I know that I'm blessed to be in it, and I'm happy to do the work. And my parents told me when I was a kid, you know, it's like be prepared to work twice as hard as anybody else to achieve what you want. And that's no joke, and it's not just one of those things your parents say. It's about you rising to the level you know, that you hope to be at and what it's going to take to get there and also what it's going to take to feel comfortable when you arrive. I mean, do you know what you're doing? You know, do every job. Do every job on the way up and treat every experience like you own the company. If you're, if you're sweeping the floor, then be the oh, no. best Make floor sweeper. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Make the floor oh, it's shine. It's true. It's true. You have to do everything. I've done every, right. every tiny and mercurial task in, in my company outside of, I'm really not good at the computer. That was before my time. But <laughs> let's be honest. Um, but I've done everything. I've shipped. I've picked and packed. I've, I've written invoices. I've, I've calculated my orders by hand, because it was before computers. I've, I've cut my production. Mm -hmm. I've sat in factories. I've, I've put hang tags on my clothes and poly bags. I've gathered it up and, and run to receiving at, at stores 
you know, trying to get my foot in the door. I've rented also, junk vans to hard, drive them. Hard work. Don't scare them. Hard work. <laughs> is, <laughs> no, they need to be scared. Hard work is actually <laughs> fun. Yeah. It okay? is. If you love it the is work. It is fun. If you like what you do, right. it is fun. And the most yep. humiliating moments that you encounter will end up to be your best souvenirs and your best stories when you're famous. Yeah. Remember that. Now, did everyone on this stage intern during their college experience? Yes. Yes? Yeah. Okay, so who has a grueling story about their favorite day as an intern that wants to share? Um, oh? On camera? I don't know. <laughs> this is being live streamed, remember. <laughs> Anybody? Oh. You're looking at me. I, I'm well, looking I at you because okay, you did I, say I did, something. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so, so I um, was, I barely made it through college. I did not have a lot of money. My mother is a piano teacher. Not exactly the most lucrative job you can have. And um, so we were, it was pretty tough at the end, and I was interning at Donna Karen. And I don't know if you guys can really, it's hard to put this into perspective, but when I was working at Donna Karen, when Edward was, it's kind of shocking to hear the story that he didn't get in because he's probably one of the most incredible designers I've ever seen. I'll never forget walking in and seeing his sketches on the wall. I was mesmerized. I don't know if he, I think I told him this that I took them and drew over them at night and <laughs> sketched over. He was incredible. At any rate, um, so I was excited on my first day and uh, I came in sweatpants because that's kind of all I had and everyone is wearing like 40 ply cashmere and like <laughs> dripping in it in like seven layers and I'm like, hi, I'm your intern. <laughs> mortified. And, um, and the room is tiny, so there's no place to hide. And so I went over and said, what can I do? And Ann Gorfinkel, who was the fabric person, said, can you just go and clean that closet? I was like, yes, I am on that. I will clean that closet right now. I'm so much happier in the closet. And um, I went into the back room, and I, went, I walked in there, and it was unbelievable. It was their vintage closet, so it was all of their archive samples of beautiful beaded garments and vintage pieces that they had collected for inspiration, and I got to spend the entire day cleaning closet. It was the best day ever. So see, cleaning Anne, a closet Anne isn't that big. bad. You never know what's behind the doors of the closet. And so. Anne was an intern, too. <laughs> Every, yeah. everybody. Everybody. I was not an intern. I was never an intern. I went straight to, I didn't know about internships. <laughs> I didn't know about it. I didn't, there were no blocks. I said, I need a summer job, mm -hmm. you know? It and was a different said, time. Now you yeah. guys have so much access to find out about internships online. I mean, you, if you just Google the word internship, who even knows how many listings will come up? And I think the lesson is that everyone you know, that's done it, it's been an incredibly positive experience. So probably, I want to ask you, what's one of the most positive learning experiences that you had as an intern, and where did you have your internship? Um, you know, the, the first thing that I think um, with internship or like working as an assistant designer, design assistant at different houses, what I learned pretty early on was, you know, when a lot of us, when we were in school, we had this idea about, you know, you want to be a designer, you want to be famous and all that stuff, the glamorous aspect. I pretty much learned early on that, you know, uh, fame is the byproduct of hard work. And that was the first thing that I learned in, when I was an intern there. So my internship was at also Donna Karen. And, you know, so, however, yeah, it was. And, um, however, you know, it was pretty much that kind of thing. Like, it was the internship, what it taught me was there were a few things that you needed to have to, you know, uh, follow your dreams and everything was the passion, commitment, and the grit. You know, I think it's, there are a lot of talented designers out there and a lot of talented people out there. How, what I always question myself, and, and as a student, as an intern, as an employee, and now as uh, owning my own company also, I always question, how long are you willing to go on? You know, that kind of commitment is what I think is going to take you further, because talent alone doesn't do it, passion doesn't al al alone do it. I think it's how long, the grit factor is extremely important. So, I mean, you know, for all the in, in students, you know, who are going to apply, I think there's, the best thing to do is research, internship, talk, and explore, and, and rightfully, all of them have already said, and I'm just reiterating what, what they said, it's the ability, um, the willingness to make mistakes. That's the first thing that you need to appreciate it, and you know, just go for it, and that's pretty much it, yeah. And if you get depressed, write your diary. <laughs> <laughs> You could turn it into a best-selling book one day when you guys are famous designers. I mean, no, no, there's no better friend than a diary when you're depressed because you can do just download it. And, uh, and just I make, think... Just make sure you don't write anything 
you know. Oh, doesn't not a matter. Burn book. You as want a diary, not a matter. burn book. As long as you say the truth, I think the most important, the other big advice that I, I will tell anyone, but especially young people, is that the most important relationship in life is the one you have with yourself. And if you have that, and if you are your best friend, then, you know, it's just much easier. And any other relationship after that is a plus and not a must. I have to tell you, I learned so much from my interns that I have, you know, um, because of the technology today that they teach me so much. They enha actually enhance my work. So, you know, we welcome interns at yeah. our office. So let's Can talk, I've oh, sorry, go ahead. On one more word on interns, because internships are so important, because you get to, go into a company and decide if it's really for you, if this work really is something that you want to do, if it's what you thought it was, if, if maybe what's different about it draws you in even more. And you also get to, to meet people, network, and show people the best of you, you know? I mean, these are people that you can call for references. I've hired so many interns in our company, um, and it's really, if I see someone who, Oh, they've got a good personality and they fit in well and they're willing to do whatever is necessary, I will hire that person over someone who is extremely talented um, because I know that they're going to help me run my company, you know, and they're going to take pride in their work. So let's talk about getting these internships. When these students are putting together a resume or a portfolio, what are the important things that you guys look for that they can focus on, whether they can focus their coursework to kind of help them pursue that, or what are those buzzwords and what should they be doing outside of school? Because I don't think fashion is just about what you do in school, it's also pursuing it through hobbies and interests. Um, what are things that stand out on a resume or in a portfolio? Their skills. Some. Jenna has a great. I have some. Okay, <laughs> rule number one, spell my name right. <laughs> I mean, Spell her name the right. number of times I've gotten letters from people, first of all, they're not hand signed, not hand, like, spell, spell the name right, do some research, find out who the person is that you're sending the letter to. It's so important, I cannot believe how sometimes people make simple mistakes, that resume goes in the trash. If you can't take that moment to, to spell someone's name right, it's important. The other thing is, write a handwritten note. It's so important, it's so hard to cut through these days, and with email, like, don't email somebody and ask for an internship. Write a handwritten note. It stands out. People will remember you. Don't write it on crazy handwriting paper. Just pick something clean and normal. Black and white is good. Um, don't go crazy. No flowers. Um, and those things like really mean they're meaningful. They'll stand out because it's so unlike it's so unusual to get a handwritten note and a hand address note in the mail. And I'll look at that before I'll look at the ten other things that come through my email box. And I think you can't underestimate. And also write a thank you note. If you get an interview or if you get someone to, who calls you back, send a thank you note. It really matters these days. It matters more than you will know because as email and electronics has become, it's changed the industry, it has made the communications and the way that we communicate so much more valuable when someone takes that time. So think about that. And the personal touch is really, really valuable. Um, all, most companies, we have them, have a part on our website that lets you know where to go to find an internship. I would imagine that most of the bigger companies that you know do. I don't know if yeah. you guys, some of the smaller companies, but, and oftentimes, like, especially with smaller companies, if you're interested in them, you have no idea. They, they don't have the time to go and search for you, so you have to search for them. If you want to work for Jason, write him a handwritten letter and tell him why. Trust me, that'll be more meaningful than like just putting your name in line and putting it in an inbox. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I agree. I mean, it's like always to take the time and uh, to know what you're getting into. And as to Jenna's, what Jenna said, you know, when, when you write a letter, double check. Don't say, dear Mr. Wu, I'd love to intern at Donna Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Edit your letters would be very nice. I've gotten that before. And, uh, and you know, always edit your letters and, and, and then be personal because people, no one can take that away from you. You are the only you there is. And just by a simple note that has no frills um, can mean the world. I mean, I keep all of my notes and, uh, and I, I, I just think that they are something that I really remember, especially in today when there's so much noise and there's so much disposable things that um, when somebody takes the time to send me something handwritten, and Trust me, it always gets to the person, no matter how big the office is, it always yeah, I think gets to the person. sometimes people get worried that it's not gonna get it to the right person, yeah. but you guys have assistants and departments that will make sure that it gets to the people that you're trying to get it to, so well, make the effort for it sure. It stands out, I mean, a, a handwritten note will stand out, and I think people give it more care, honestly. 
and work, think work on your portfolio. I mean, your portfolio is so important. What you show and how much love and the presentation and the cleanness and the point of view. And also your portfolio is actually not important just for the people that you show it to, but it's important to you because it's really your first juice. It's your first collection at school or it's your first drawings. <coughs> and they actually, later, much later, if you look at it, you will realize that it actually said a lot about who you are and even who you became. So your first portfolio, your portfolio is very, very important. So love it, treat it with respect, make it beautiful, improve it, and cherish it. It's cherish a it. You don't need to have one yeah. for an internship. It's a you love it. You should want to look at it Treat all the time. Like now, we've talked about technology a little bit and how it's really changing this industry. So with technology, I'm guessing a lot of new jobs have emerged. And you know, not everyone in this room wants to be a, a designer. Jobs have gone. And have gone, yes. And I was talking to a group of students earlier, and just in that group, somebody wanted to be a stylist. Um, somebody else wanted to be a fashion merchandiser. So knowing what you know about the industry, what are some of the new careers that are emerging that you know maybe we didn't have a chance to be a part of, but that all of these students, when they enter the workforce, will have that opportunity? What are some of the newer career tracks that maybe they could think about following? Um, I think, I mean, now, besides, you know, there's a designer, there's a technical designer in the design field. You know, there's, like, so many aspects to it. Um, there's a print designer and all that stuff. But yeah, I think... In 3D. In 3D, uh, yeah, 3D. Exactly. And then there's... In, where is in public relations and, you know, there's, like, a... Earlier on, I think they used to just have a PR director, PR manager, VP of communications. Now they have a social media, you know, director. There's the technology has completely changed the how we interact, you know, in this industry. So, um, I mean, is there anything else you guys can think of? I think um, there's a whole. I mean, uh, from where I wish. I mean, you know, I wish the, the question should be asked. I mean, someone like Ava Chen. You know, I think you might have. A, I mean, she's yeah. very prolific out there. Yeah, I'm gonna you come know, out yeah. to Ava. Yeah. Do you mind if you take that question? Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> not to put you on the spot. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm actually, um, as soon as I ask her the question, I want to hear from you guys. Um, I know this morning I asked you to think about some questions, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and find me, or there's also two people with mics circulating around. If you can grab one of them, they okay. would love to take your questions. Right, guys? Yes? yes. Okay. Oh, no, she, has, she has the mic. She has the oh, mic. you do. Okay, great. Here, I'll bring you mine. <laughs> I love being put on the spot very spontaneously with absolutely zero I'm sorry, preparation. I think, I think you're brilliant at it. I love it. you. So, I think you are brilliant at it. That's um, why. So, uh, you know, Prabhu brought up the very, very good point of social media, and all of you guys in this room, being high school and college students, I'm sure, are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I know every all the designers here in the room as well are all obsessed with Instagram. Um, so that is a career path that's opening up for so many young people right now. In our office, we have a social media director named Virginia Nam. She came to us from Rebecca Minkoff, and it was her job, literally, to be behind the scenes with Rebecca, tracking her every move, taking pictures, um, tweeting, Instagramming, doing Vine videos, Snapchatting for her, and it's a 24-7 job. All of you guys who are on social media know it doesn't turn off ever, but it's an amazing opportunity, and every designer sitting up there they have a social media department as well, and all the designers are on social media. Um, one word of caution as students, um, you know, if you are on social media, just remember that you're leaving kind of digital breadcrumbs of your personality. This is kind of not really answering the question, yeah, but... Um, yeah. You are on record. You're on record, basically, and it's not uncommon for us, for instance, when I... My assistant, actually, I found through social media. She followed me on Twitter. And then she sent me an email that basically was like, this is so embarrassing. Um, so she, I had tweeted, like, I can't get this horrible song out of my head. Uh, just to be honest, it was a Maroon 5, like, Adam <laughs> Levine song. And it was, like, stuck in my head. And I was like, if I hear this song one more time. And she wrote me an email that was like, I have that song stuck in my head, too. And then she introduced herself. And she talked a lot about Lucky and why she loved the magazine. And she made it personal, as uh, Diane mentioned. And so we kind of connected through social media. So if you use it wisely, you can find a job as well. But don't use it indiscriminately. Don't post pictures of yourself doing things you wouldn't want your teacher or your mom or your future boss to see. That or is your all. children. So <laughs> thanks. And can I add one thing to the social media? Um, I can't even tell you that some of the best people on social media are incredible journalists and writers. So these are not people that are just funny because or interesting because a lot of them 
studied English in college. You know, a lot of them are storytellers. So you get to craft a voice in college and study and take classes that create that for you so that you can go on to do the social media path as well. Thank you so much. Sorry to do that. Okay, you're tw she's tweeting right now. Okay, so who has a question? Because I know, oh, here, I'll come to you. Will you say your name and introduce yourself and tell me what school you're from? Yeah. My name is Heaven. I'm from Richard Wright, and I just want to know, like, when you make your outfits or your designs, what goes through your heads? What do you think about? You know, for me, a lot of times I'm thinking about the customer, um, the person that I hope is going to wear the clothes. Um, that's a big part of it um, and super important to me. Um, sometimes you you have an inspiration, you saw a beautiful painting, you you travel to some place amazing, there are colors that you know you saw on the beach or, or in the city that inspired you or, or wonderful textiles. Um, but ultimately, I want the clothing to get worn. So I'm thinking how how can someone wear this fabric? How can I make this um, a beautiful dress or a coat or something like that that someone can wear and enjoy and really get some use out of? I immerse myself. I travel a great deal, so I basically immerse myself, whether I'm in um, Bali or I'm in Asia or, um, you know, I just, I, I, I make it come to life. Um, through prints, through fabric, um, depending on the season. Um, I try and be as creative as I possibly can. And then like Tracy said, I, I have a customer that I sell to, so I try and stay, keep her in mind at all times. You know, depending on her body type, there, there's so many different body types out there, and you can't really dress everybody, but that's where the challenge comes in is figuring out how can you maximize a garment and how many people can wear it. I'm constantly <laughs> thinking like that because, you know, I, I just can't go off into my, I can't, I could, the dreaming has to stop at some point and it has to land into reality. So that's where, you, that's where the real challenge comes in for me. Thank and you. I mean for us designers, it's generally, <clears throat> I, you know, I was called like, I call myself, like we're like kind of like blenders and we, we, we take all the experiences that we experience, not just visual things, but things that we experience, things that we hear and things that we see and things that we feel that may or may not happen within our industry. In fact, don't look for inspiration just in your field. Look for outside of the field because I think that's when you re really find fresh ideas and, uh, and you take all of that and that's what I'm thinking and uh, that becomes your work. You know, we put it all together. And, and, and every designer approaches it in a different way. We talked about Maria Cornejo. She's all about geometry. I mean, were you good in geometry? I mean, her construction of her clothes are so incredibly clever and, and wonderful. Somebody else comes from another. Everybody, you know, everybody has a different point of view how they get there. Me, I just like to make it practical and sexy and somehow combine <laughs> it, you know? And uh, everybody goes their own way and everybody finds their own, you know, DNA. And after that, you call it a DNA or brand or shut up. You <laughs> All right, we have one more question, table nine. Make it a good one. Good one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stand up, what's your name? Oh, um, my name is Laura Mejia. I'm from High School of Art and Design. And my question is, before you guys were fashion designers, did you guys um, have any inspiration that motivated you to want to be a fashion designer? I'll answer that because I'm from art and design. <laughs> and art and design has great teachers. You're in the fashion design department? Oh, it's, it's wonderful. And my teacher, my draping teacher, is the one who actually encouraged me. Um, to, to go, get out there, familiarize myself um, with different designers. So she was really a big help. She actually got me my first interview with Mary McFadden. Um, and from there, I felt like I could do anything. Okay, and I actually think we have time for one more question. You had a question? Hi, go ahead and stand up. Tell us your name. Hi, my name's Edison. I go to the Baltimore Design School. And I was just wondering, one thing that's always worried me when I start to think about it is how do you get started into the whole process of getting an internship and getting a, your first job? 
and in a way, I suppose, how much paperwork is there going to be? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that one. Um, I mean, so most most companies, like I was talking about a little before, on like on the website. If you go to most companies' websites, at the bottom of their website, there'll often be a little thing that says "Contact us." Just click on that and write an email to, because you're going to get just an HR department at that point, and you can just say, "Is there a, how, who do I read, write to, or what is is there what does your internship look like? Do you have an internship program?" Because you first need to find out if the company even accepts interns. Not all companies can do take them, so you can that you can do in an email, and then once you get that information, then you can ask who, in fact, do I address this to? At that point, then when you find out that there's somebody, a point person, then you can actually go ahead and write that proper letter by hand, spell their name, ask the, the spelling 10 times, and um, and go ahead and then send a formal request letter. I mean, I blanket bombed, I sent many, but the other thing is most often the schools will help you do that as well. I went to Parsons and Parsons had a, a board and a person in the office who would help you get connections to the people who were looking for interns. So oftentimes the schools, that the colleges will have access. If you're in high school and you're looking to get an internship, you're gonna have to do a little bit there's, there's not a lot of paperwork, it's not hard. Um, you know, we're not looking for paper pushers, we're looking for people who are interesting and creative, so we're not really interested in making you fill out a bunch of forms and all that, it's pretty straightforward. Well, yeah. we'll work you hard, to the bone. <laughs> and <laughs> Diane, I think you wanted yeah, to add I just, to that. I just want to say one thing before we wrap up, um, because we talked about many things, but we forgot to mention the word dream. And I think that dream is the most important thing. And we happen to be sitting today in the White House that was built on a dream, and with a president and a first lady who made their dream come true. And we are very privileged to have you as a president and as a first lady, and I want you to thank you very much because it's dreams that will make us go forward. And so don't ever forget to dream, and just you'll make your dream come true. Right. Thank you. So before we end the panel today, I want to play a quick rapid fire question game for you guys. Prepared very, very important questions um, to have you answer. So we'll just go down the line. I'm going to start with you. So I'm going to call out the question, pretty much a one word answer, okay? Because we're a little pressed for time. Ready? Favorite class in high school? Um. None now. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Um, I would say um, draping. Draping. Okay. First record or CD you bought. Don't date yourself. Uh, no. <laughs> Stevie Wonder. Oh, <laughs> I like that. Um, who should everyone follow on Instagram, Diane? Oh, mm. Rihanna. Oh. She's not there anymore. <laughs> this so. is their audience. They're into that. <laughs> Oh, she was banned from Instagram. Yeah, oh, no? How come? Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there yeah. was, yeah. Okay. Who should everyone follow on Instagram? Michelle Obama. <laughs> um, <laughs> Michelle Obama. Yes, I love that. Okay, here's a better question. What did you wear to your prom? I made a dress in white silk file with <laughs> gold piping. Ooh, Do you have yes. a picture? It was a flapper dress. I had somewhere. You should post it on Twitter so they can yeah. all see it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jason, if you were a teacher, what would you teach? Pastry. <laughs> <laughs> he is a sweet tooth. Um, Jenna, what book did you read in school that really positively shaped who you are today? Positively. Um, ooh. Or just that you loved, that they should all read. <laughs> oh, a book that you should all read? Um, I'm going to say uh, The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. Right. Okay, back to you. Um, what language do you wish you could speak? Uh, Chinese. I wish. No, seriously, I do. I mean, I think it's you know that's the thing. It's like the most important. Absolutely, Edward. Favorite dessert? A sorbet. Ooh. Mango sorbet. That's a light one. Jason, favorite dessert? Macaroon. <laughs> okay, Diane. What person do you wish you could take a road trip with? Oh, alive. Could that right? Yes, alive. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I would say Leonardo da Vinci. Alive. Um, President? I'm wondering if she can make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> you would go along for a ride as a passenger. What is the last song you downloaded? Ooh. Uh, the, the last Prince album. 
I, I, you know, was I'm it good? an old school Prince fan. Yeah, it is good. <laughs> um, what's your favorite word, Jason? Uh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and Jenna, what's a surprising hobby you have that we might not know? I was going to say yeah, that I can, I can say in public. <laughs> Jason just told me I should say lumberjack. I'm going to go with that. <laughs> lumberjack. Okay, then besides your iPhones, what is one thing that all of you do not leave home without? Um, my backpack. It has everything there. So, yeah. <laughs> Edward? Yeah. Oh, gosh. I kind of take everything with me all Tissues the time. Tissues today, so your allergies. <laughs> yes, my allergy <laughs> medicine. <laughs> My camera, I mean, that's the most important. My Canon camera, I always have it with me. Mints, for me, I just threw myself in there. Go ahead, Tracy. Lipstick. A uh, man purse. <laughs> a man purse. <laughs> Jenna? Of course, um, for a man. Oh, God, I thought I was going to get a different question. Um, I don't know. Um, I always wear this ring. It never leaves my hand. There you go. All right, well, thank you guys well, thank so, you. so much. Thank you. thank you. And also... Thank you to all of these incredible students for letting us be a part of your day. This is, I know, an amazing experience for you, but it is really a privilege to have spent this day with you. So thank you guys so, so much, and thank you for everyone that asked questions. I'm going to pass it over to our beautiful host, Mrs. Obama. Thank you all so much. Let's give our panelists another round of applause. Liliana, thank you. You did a great job. Oh. I don't know about you, but that was pretty fascinating. I mean, I am not interested in developing a career in fashion, and I found it riveting, so I hope you all did too. Now, let me just say one thing. If I were you, you all students sitting in here, I would be either writing somebody in this room, I'd be getting a card, I would get my personal notes together right now because my letter would be addressed to whoever, I was one of the students that was at the White House panel, I attended this workshop, we sat in the lunch, I mentioned something that they heard or a quote, and I'd say I was, you know, now is the time to get, this is an opportunity. This is a door. Is a door. And so all of you, you, you are competing with each other. Uh, and, and now you've got to think about how are you going to use this opportunity? You know, just don't sit here and eat the lunch and take a nap and go to the next workshop, but figure out how you're going to turn this into the next thing that you want to do. You guys have the easiest step into a lot of these internships because my guess is that they're going to remember you, right? And don't, be shy. and don't be shy. Networking is the key. The people who are successful are the people who are willing to reach out and say, hi, my name is X. You met me here. Let me tell you something about myself. Look a person in the eye. Speak clearly. You know, that's what's going to get you to the next step. So the question, now your next challenge is, what are you going to do after today? What are you going to do with this opportunity? You know, and if you're not going to do anything with it, then give it to somebody else, okay? Give it to somebody else, somebody in your class, somebody in your school, a sister, but don't waste it, okay? This is really special, um, so make the most of it. It won't be the last door that you have access to, but this door is real different. And you have to think, when's the next time I'm going to be invited to the White House? Because I think about that all the time. <laughs> I tell my kids, take a look around now, because you may never get invited back here again. <laughs> so. <laughs> but I want to thank everyone here for making this dream. This was really a dream of mine um, in so many ways um, to have this industry and all those who have supported me, who do so much for uh, people to make us feel beautiful and ready to get out there. Let me tell you, fashion is, plays an important role in my confidence. My ability to do my job is really linked to how I feel about what I'm wearing. Uh, you know, so this is some big stuff. Uh, so I'm grateful to all of you for everything you've done for me, everything you've been willing to do for these young people. Um, and, you know, let's keep thinking about what more we can do. That's always, what's the next step? So I am grateful to you all. I hope you guys have enjoyed the day. I think there's more stuff to come. I was supposed to say something. Have I said everything I'm supposed to say, Meredith? <laughs>
Okay, all right, you guys take it easy. Enjoy yourselves.